With over 35 years of ministry, Mount Zion Church is located in Clarkston, Michigan. You may have seen us while driving an I-75 just north of Great Lakes Crossing. We invite you today to join us as we go inside to hear a fresh and relevant word in this new day. Mount Zion, helping you experience the best life. I've known the Lord as long as I can remember, but I do remember in Sunday school as a small child hearing someone say, you need to come to the altar and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And that's a vivid uh, memory in my mind. But in my thinking, it's like I've always known who God was. And, and, and since I was a child, my mom would talk to us about Bible stories, etc. And, and so I can relate more to the scripture that says that we were called in Christ before the foundation of the world. Because how many know that when we come to Christ, we're just recognizing what God has already done. But for many people, that change comes much later in life, so you can relate more, perhaps, to that dramatic experience. But for me, there's been many dramatic encounters I've had with God, and dramatic experiences of faith. When I faced adversity, I turned to God and found out God's salvation includes many areas of life. That's why, like the Apostle Paul, I can say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to eat, reach every single area of our life. Can you say amen to that? We want to walk in the fullness. Now, God doesn't just save us from hell. The Bible teaches us that the example we're to follow is the example of the Jews in the Old Testament. How many know the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God? and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and correction in righteousness. And the Bible tells us that all these things were written for our example. There was a time when the people of God were slaves in Egypt and the Lord raised up Moses to bring them out of Egypt. He sent Moses there and through miraculous things, he brought them a great deliverance. That's one of the words for salvation, delivering them out of Egypt so that they could what? go to the promised land that God had spoken to their forefather, Abraham, literally 400 years earlier. How many know God has an eternal plan? So we're a part of that plan in the age of our life and the time of history in which we live, but it's been an ongoing process. And so the Lord wanted them not just to come out of their slavery, but he wanted to take them to the promised land. And the Bible tells us that after they left Egypt, they went to the wilderness, and there they had to exercise faith for food, for water, for clothing. There were a lot of faith encounters, but when they came to the promised land, the Bible says when they saw that there were giants in the land, they said, we can't take that land. We're like grasshoppers before them. They saw themselves in relationship to the giants, and they're like, it'll never happen. How many know when you come to a situation that's bigger than you, it's a faith opportunity? When you come to a situation that seems like it's going to be overwhelming, you've got to say to yourself, well, I know that with me that's not possible, but I'm convinced that with God all things are possible. Amen? And God says he wants a people who can walk in the fullness of his salvation so that we can receive the life he has for us. Amen? Now, I want to talk about the ministry of Jesus Christ and the three levels of how that's expressed. Isaiah chapter 16 is about the ministry of Jesus Christ and certainly the gospel that Jesus preached. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. And Jesus in the gospels related this prophetic word to himself. He said he was anointed to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to them that are bound. How many know with God there's hope in every area of our life? Isn't that amazing that the anointing of the ministry of Jesus Christ isn't just to save us from something in the future, but the message of Christ is he can bind up a broken heart. The message of Jesus Christ is just like in our announcement today about our class for people who are caught in addiction. He came to set the captives free. He came to open up the prison doors. Amen. The gospel is also good tidings to the poor. That means whether you're poor in spirit, which would be in your personal self, or poor in money, how many glad the gospel can touch you in all those areas? Now, the first thing that I see about the ministry of Jesus Christ, it was one of compassion. 
Literally, the Bible says there were times in his ministry when Jesus, moved by compassion, did such and such. And Jesus came by his compassion the same way we often do. The Bible tells us that when he was raised and when he was growing up, he went through some very difficult times. At Christmas time, we'll celebrate the incarnation, but we'll also rehearse the story about when he was born, there was no room for his mother in the inn. He was born in a stable. There were all kinds of things in his life, in his natural life, that worked compassion in him. He didn't come to a rosy life, if you would. He didn't come to a a life that was without problems. The Bible says that he came and he was tempted with every area of temptation that we have to. And again, that's not just about sin. That's about the struggles that we have in life. Struggles sometimes that we go through from the date of our nativity, just like with Jesus Christ. But what happened to him is he had compassion. He took the difficulties of his life and he turned them around. He didn't make them about himself. He made them about the needs of other people. And so the anointing came upon a person who had that compassion worked inside of them. And it was through that his ministry began to grow and began to prosper. Continuing in that same chapter, it says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and to console those who mourn in Zion. To what? Give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness. What? Read this part with me. The planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. How many out there understand that God wants to glorify his name through your life? Amen. God wants to do something in you that's a testimony. God wants to do something in you that's going to cause other people to say, wow, look what God is able to do in their life. That tells me it isn't just something internal. It's going to be something that's going to be lived out as we're the trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord will bear the fruit that God has called us to bear. So here Jesus was moved by compassion. And then the Bible says he comforted and he consoled. How many, how many glad today that the Holy Spirit is given to comfort us? Amen. The Holy Spirit is called the comforter. He's called the helper. And I believe that God has given us through the Holy Spirit a a comfort. Uh, And the word literally means the one who comes to live right next to us. So that as we're going through life and we have problems, we can know that God can comfort us and console us by speaking about his goodness to us. And also, of course, reminding us of the great promises that he has. And it should also be the endeavor of the body of Christ to comfort those who mourn in Zion. And that's talking about in the Old Testament, the children of God. But in the New Testament, it reveals the people of God as well. How many know when somebody is comforted, we should comfort them? Amen? But I want you to understand the ministry of Jesus Christ went to another phase, and that's the conquest phase or the exchange phase, if you would. Because God wanted to give them beauty for their ashes. He wanted to give them the oil of joy for their mourning, and he wanted to give them the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel good to think, God cares if I'm depressed. God cares if I'm anxious. God cares if I'm sad. God cares about every aspect of my life because he created his body, soul, and spirit. He receives us in the entirety of who we are, and he cares about those things. But he doesn't just care about those things in the sense that he has compassion and comfort. I believe with all my heart, we the people of God need to know there's also deliverance in Zion. There's freedom in Zion. There's the power of God that can come to us as we open up our heart to God and say, Lord, I want the good news. I want the gospel. I want every part of it that you had. The anointing that you had when you were here on the earth, I know now is upon the people of God. And Lord, we want to receive receive the fullness of all that you have. He don't want us just going through life defeated, thinking about eternity alone. He wants us to be healed. He wants us to be delivered. He wants to work that perfect work in each and every one of us. And, And I would like to make a statement about this, and that is what you believe matters. You see, what you believe forms the context in your mind of your expectation. So when the Lord comes to you and he 
has compassion and you're aware that he's in your life, when the Lord comes to you and you feel the context of the comfort that God has for you, you need to also have the mindset of the fullness of what God has because if you're not thinking right, you're not gonna set the mindset to go after everything that God has. And sometimes we just comfort ourselves in this place where we're not living in the victorious level that God has for us. And so what you believe absolutely matters. It sets the basis for your expectation. And I believe the gospel. I believe what God says. And that's what this next verse of scripture says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Obviously, this is the same scripture, but I'm emphasizing a different part of it. For it is the power of God to salvation to whom? For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed again from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall what? Amen. We don't want to just think about our past tense experience, although we should always believe and hold on to those things. But what is your reality today? That's why you have to understand the message of the gospel says now to him who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. How many know that we need to know God can do something bigger than our thinking? The reason for that is your human thinking. You can give the Lord a praise on that. Your human thinking has been formed by your experiences. So there's a truth in that. Your human thinking is set on the institutions that are around you. So there is a truth in that. There's a rational thought behind his thinking. But God says, I have a different plan. And my plan is I'm going to do something that's above what you could ask or think according to the power that what? To him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever Amen. You see, there's a difference between the philosophy of the world that's so pervading, as I said, as a seed in society, and that's why it keeps coming back, because in that seed of society, there's this idea that you're always a victim, and so how do we take care of that? Well, we have to fight against the people that have oppressed us, and it brings all kinds of problems in the process of human conflict as a result. Where God says, as impossible as it might seem to you, I want you to know that if you will let me, I'll do something on the inside of you, says the Lord. You see, that's why when I hear the news about what's happening in our country, people talk about persecution of Christianity, whether it's here in other countries, I know something. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. My conflict is not with the world. I got to understand something. Okay, what are you going to do in the church today that you haven't done before that's going to give us the power to rise up and face the situations that we're in today? This past week, I was encouraged. I always go to Christian movies that are made by Christians because I like to support what Christians are doing to get involved in all the different areas of life. And there was a movie called Woodlawn that came out last week. I didn't get around to seeing it, so I saw it this Thursday. And I was excited because it, for me, it was a movie that confirmed what the Lord was speaking to me on Sunday and what the Lord was speaking to me, and I preached it on Wednesdays. And the movie, the setting of the movie took place during the Jesus People Movement back in 1973. That's when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's when my wife, Bonnie, gave her life to the Lord. And we saw God do an amazing thing. And, and, and if you lived in those days, it was something even the secular media was noticing. And they showed a picture of Time Magazine where it talked about the Jesus Revolution. It was making all the magazines because everybody saw God do something so amazing. And so for me, it was like, oh, Lord, thank you for what you did yesterday. But I'm building up, Lord, because I'm going to believe there's something more that's in front of us. Amen. <laughs> Now, the beauty of the story, now I look back, people talk about how bad times are, and I look back and say, well, there was, in the late 60s, early 70s, there was social unrest, there was a war that was tearing our country apart, there was all kinds of political debates and animosity filling the country, we have an economic trouble, and guess what, it seems to be happening all over again, what goes around comes around, 
But in that, they tell the story about how there was a racial conflict in this high school, and, and it was growing in the flesh, as human conflicts will. But what happened is a preacher came in, and, and it involved a football team that was going through this process of integration. There was all kinds of problems. And this guy preached the gospel, and the whole football team got saved. There was another team that was their adversary, and they all came to the Lord. I tell you, God can do amazing things, amen? So the FBI was involved, the government was involved, but when God got involved, it changed the whole thing. That's why I believe, like the Apostle Paul, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto what? Salvation. And I also like to warn the body of Christ because there's 100 years or so ago that there was a common thought. It was called the social gospel, and that was, of course, based on the first two stages of the ministry of Jesus Christ, compassion and comfort, and saying, well, we've got to comfort people. And so there became a great outreach in churches to help the poor, the needy, et cetera. It was called the gospel message. There was a problem along the way that people became so caught up in the comfort of reaching out to people that they could offer in meeting their needs and having compassion on them, they forgot about where the power would come to change the circumstance and situation. And we're really countering that again in this day because we have to understand something. The power of the gospel impacts every area of a person's life. Having said that, I want to talk about Jesus Christ and his ministry here. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus is talking to the disciples and the people around him, specifically the disciples of John the Baptist. That was basically the preceding move to himself. He said, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. And read this last part with me. The poor have the gospel preached to them. Wait a minute. The what does the gospel have to do with being poor? How I many know that doesn't make any sense? Come on. I, I put up here, Christian economics is kind of a blend of compassionate capitalism, if you would. But I want to point to this story about Jesus Christ because how did he help the poor? Now, I, I'm sure that Jesus ministered in compassion and took care of the needs of the poor. That's why he gave us the story about the Good Samaritan. But Jesus also believed something that you and I have to believe, and that is the gospel has the power to take somebody out of poverty and lift them into blessing of God. Do you believe that, church? I do. And uh, I, I like to talk about these things. I, I just have this picture just so you can see a little visual. These are two books that impacted me 20 some years ago. The first is Latin America Turning Protestant, and the second one is called Cultural Shifts in a Post-Industrial Society. Not to get everybody all confused here, but uh, I, I wanted to talk about this. Now that first book I read is Latin America, or showed the picture of it's called Is Latin America Turning Protestant? Now, I bought the book because I was excited. That book literally was written shortly after the Jesus People Movement because 40 years ago, there was hardly evangelical Christian in all Latin America. And when the Jesus People Movement, Charismatic Movement came along, literally in some countries, 40% of the people became Christian. And so they were documenting it. And this was a book written at a university who was just making a, a, a study. But as a side note, they said, now, one of the other things that we're noticing is as these people are following the gospel and living according to the Bible, it's changing their economic condition. Because all of a sudden, as people become Christians and people begin to follow this gospel message that they believe in, all of a sudden, people are breaking addictions that cause poverty. Marriages are being restored because that also causes poverty. Family situations, people are becoming better parents. And all of these auxiliary things. And also, I mean, you know when you become a Christian, there's something about you now that you want a better life? Has anybody ever noticed that? Christianity inspires you it's like, I don't want to live this way anymore. I want a better life. And that's what they document in that book. And they say, wow, this is amazing. The gospel has that kind of an impact. And, and I like to share these things because I know most of you don't study sociology and history because it makes you yawn and go like that. So that you'd understand that there is documented evidence that what God says is true. 
And the book on cultural shifts points out how that in Europe, because they have a socialist economy, there's literally, again, document evidence that as countries become socialist, they begin to turn away from God. And this surprises most people. Italy, where the Vatican is, people think, oh, that's a Catholic nation. No, only 3% of the people even go to church. Why? Because if you give people government to take care of them, they'll start worshiping government rather than God. So that's why I'm telling you how important it is that we understand there's a philosophy that God has given to us. Can anybody say amen to that? And we need to know it. We need to know it with our whole heart. Now, having said that, I want to read 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. Oh, what is that? Being saved? The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved. Because, see, of course, we are saved from heaven. That's settled. I believe once you give your life to the Lord, you're his child. This isn't talking about whether you're going to go to heaven or not. This is talking about that ongoing progression of God doing something in your life. Those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And I put over there a day of reckoning because I believe that we're living in a time when we're going to see how that the wisdom of man is going to begin to crumble. And as the wisdom of man crumbles, arising from that is the people who are going to believe their God. And the Bible says those people will do exploits in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, in this next verse, it says, the Jews request a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, what? Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, when you talk to people in the world, they're going to say Christianity is just simple. That's something you can do on Sunday. But don't bring it here into your everyday life because they say it's foolishness. But God says... He wants you to know the foolishness of God is what? Wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. You see, church, I believe with all my heart we're living in a time when our nation needs answers. We're living in our time when there's a generation raising up questioning everything that's going on around them and say, well, what really works? What's true? And we need to know something. We have to have the same resolve as the Apostle Paul. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to change a life, to change a marriage, to change our economic status, to change our temperament, to change our mind so that we're looking with an exceeding expectation, knowing that with God, we can do all things. Can we all please bow our heads for just a moment? God has anointed Pastor Lauren to reach the church with a fresh message for this day. If you would like further information, we also invite you to visit us on the web at mountzion.org where you can hear more of Pastor Lauren's messages and find out about our ministries. If you're visiting the Metro Detroit area, we invite you to worship with us at Mount Zion Church. Thanks again for watching.